So for finding the area of curvilinear forms, um, it might be useful in different contexts. I mean, like if you're, if you were, for example, a landowner in an island region, or maybe even the people that want to uh, place taxation upon people that own land in island regions, or if you were somebody that wanted to farm in a place that's got a lot of rivers. So if you're in a, a coastal area where there's a lot of uh, water outlets or something into the ocean, it could be useful for people to want to know what area your land is. And so historically, it might have been a good idea to break up farmers' land into strips, you know, tracts of land, they called it, helping with taxation purposes. So you have these tracts of land, and what could be done is by looking at a map, some uh, work of the cartographer, we can chop up these seemingly difficult to calculate areas into rectangles. The idea being that if I calculate, or if I broke it up into rectangles, roughly, I, every time there was a, a diagonal bit, I could cut it up so that this horizontal line got cut roughly in half, and that would mean that this little bitty triangle here and this little bitty triangle here are roughly the same area. This is an approximation method. You know, we talked about trying to do tangents by hand previously. This is another approximation method for finding area where the contours might be curvy. This triangle here and this triangle here are about equal in size. This triangle here and this triangle here are about equal in size. The idea being that if I can calculate the area of a rectangle, which is relatively easy, by looking at the length of a given rectangle and the width of a given rectangle, then I could do that for every single strip of land, every track of land in this island farm, if you like, and I could overall figure out what the area of the island is. So that might be useful in ancient times. And in, I mean, these days, maybe we do something a little bit more, uh, more rigorous. Maybe we'd figure it out by counting up little squares or something like that. But that could be something that we could do. The nice thing about this approach is that it's applicable to graphs. So while it might be an old idea, it's got some, some new applications. Well, newish, you know, like sometime in the past few hundred years anyway. Newish enough that we might want to use it. If I happen to have something like a velocity time graph, there's a V with an arrow over top of it, and this velocity time graph is a curvilinear graph, something like this. I mean, heaven forbid I ever get a graph that looks like this. But if I did get a VT graph that looked like this, and I wanted to know what the displacement for this sucker was, the first thing that I would do is I'd start at equal in increments, maybe every five seconds, I would start breaking it up into bars. <coughs> Just like the tracks of land. And after having broken up my graph into bars, my next step would be to draw horizontals. So that the horizontal line was put in roughly so that there was a triangle poking up above the line and a triangle down below the line that were approximately equal. A nice way to do that is so that the line gets cut in two by the diagonal portion. Again, kind of like when we're doing the land calculation. And I'm going to admit this is definitely an approximation method. There's a little bit of artistry here, maybe a little bit of guessing and uh, jiggery pokery that goes on like as you're sort of figuring it out. And I'm not even going to claim that I'm perfect at it. I'm just trying to make the amount of area that I neglect and the amount of area that I include be roughly equal. So this one here, for example, it's kind of tricky. Like I'm, I'm doing a little bit of guesswork. I'm sort of guessing that that hump and these two triangles on either side are about the same. So you kind of guess that although you know, I, I'm hopeful that this is going to be fairly close to being the area, uh, of the area underneath of the curve, if I go and calculate the area of each individual rectangle using the height and the width of each individual rectangle, there's probably going to be some errors there. But it'll be close, and it'll be better than I would have gotten if I tried to do it with just a curve, because I don't really know how to approach a curve. I do know how to approach rectangles. What people have found, though, is that the, if this is the width, 
the greater that I get to making my, or sorry, the closer I get to making my width zero, that is, the more bars I do with narrow widths, the closer I'm going to get to having a right answer. Because I'm going to have less little mistakes like this one where I have a hump above and two triangles below and so on. Most of them will be triangles that way. Yeah. So then if, as you approach zero. Yeah, if you really want to express it the way we've done it in some of the, the more advanced math classes, we could say in the limit where width approaches zero, we're going to a approach a greater accuracy for our calculation. How many people have seen the notation limits? A few people that have, you've taken the grade 12 course, I'm guessing? Oh, you're taking it right now. Okay. All right. So if you're taking it right now, then maybe you've seen a little bit on limits. And that's just saying that as, th as the width gets closer and closer to zero, we might appro approach a more accurate measure of the area underneath this graph. Okay. It can be used for land. It can be used for graphs. I want to give you guys a chance, okay? So I'm going to give you guys an, a, an activity right now. I'd like you to calculate the area under velocity time graph, and at least a portion of this is going to be curvilinear. 